fight for religious freedom. The Supreme Court reaches a ruling on a cross on public land in Maryland. We have a full report. One year later, on the anniversary of the allegations of credible abuse against Theodore McCarrick, analysis on how they changed the church. Story of survival. A cardinal from Sri Lanka tells us how Catholics there are coping following the deadly Easter bombings. And they're all pitching in. The Archdiocese of Manila is preparing an unusual birthday gift for Cardinal Luis Antonio Tagle. On EWTN News Nightly for Thursday, June 20th, 2019. Good evening from Washington, D.C., and thank you for joining us for News from a Catholic Perspective. I'm Wyatt Goolsby, in for Lauren Ashburn. The Supreme Court saves a cross-shaped World War I monument. Their 7-2 decision means the cross will stay put on government land in Bladensburg, Maryland. That's where correspondent Jason Calvey reports tonight. Jason? Good evening, Wyatt. Take a look at the Bladensburg Peace Cross. It's a 40-foot memorial to the dead of World War I. It's been part of a bitter lawsuit since 2012, but tonight it's going to stand right where it's been, right here, for nearly 100 years. They were important, and what they did for America was important, because they died for our freedom. World War I was a horrible war, but they went to war, they did their duty, and they paid the ultimate sacrifice, and we should honor them. The American Legion raised money to build the monument, and it was completed in 1925. Not only this cross, but other crosses through the United States are now protected, and they will not be torn down. That's a, that's a great victory for all veterans. The cross honors the 49 dead of Prince George's County, Maryland. And one of the names inscribed on here is Thomas Fenwick. I met his niece the day the Supreme Court heard this case four months ago. I go by it all the time. I only live a mile away. And so I'm in the area all the time. And, you know, every time I go by, I remember him. The Supreme Court heard the case in February. On one we side, the American Humanist Association, which includes atheists and Thank agnostics, you. they said the cross violated the Constitution. This is not just a historical monument. It's something that's discriminatory and exclusionary, and we're happy to represent the other side. Lower courts agreed this cross had to go. But the Supreme Court saves the cross. Justice Samuel Alito wrote today's majority opinion for the seven justices. The fact that the cross is undoubtedly a Christian symbol should not blind one to everything else that the Bladensburg Cross has come to represent. A symbolic resting place for ancestors who never returned home. A place for the community to gather and honor all veterans and their sacrifices for this nation and a historical landmark. Two justices dissented, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Sonia Sotomayor. Ginsburg writes, as I see it, when a cross is displayed on public property, the government may be presumed to endorse its religious content. And it's been very interesting standing out here for several hours today. The amount of people honking their horn, giving thumbs up, celebrating today's victory. But this doesn't mean crosses are going to suddenly sprout up on government land across the country. The Supreme Court made a clear distinction between this long-standing religious monument and new ones. And there's a lot to dissect in their decisions today. Seven of the nine justices wrote to explain their views. Wyatt? Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvey reporting from Maryland. Thanks, Jason. One year ago today, credible allegations of sexual abuse were raised publicly by then Cardinal Theodore McCarrick, but some church experts say we may not have heard the last of McCarrick. I think it's better to characterize him as gone, but definitely not forgotten. Uh, there's, a, there's a hole in the history of the church, in the American church, where McCarrick has been, and I think we need to fill that hole. We need to fill it with the truth. We need to fill it with some real measure of transparency. Uh, in the in St. Matthew's Cathedral here in Washington earlier this week, they removed um, Theodore McCarrick's coat of arms from where it was displayed next to all the other archbishops. And that left a gap, a physical gap. And I think that's, that's representative of how a lot of Catholics are feeling. After mounting pressure from the allegations, McCarrick resigned from the College of Cardinals and later was defrocked from the church. For more on the story, including a timeline of events regarding Theodore McCarrick, visit our partners at catholicnewsagency.com. President Donald Trump says Iran, quote, made a very big mistake in shooting down a U.S. drone. The attack comes amid heightened tensions between Tehran and Washington. The U.S. military says the unprovoked attack occurred over international airspace in the Strait of Hormuz. Iran's Revolutionary Guard says it shot down the drone, like the one seen here, over Iranian airspace. 
The president spoke about the incident today while meeting with Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau at the White House. I find it hard to believe it was intentional, if you want to know the truth. I think that it could have been somebody who was uh, loose and stupid that did it. But we'll be able to report back, and you'll understand exactly what happened. But it was a very foolish move. After the talks with Trudeau, President Trump was expected to meet with members of Congress at the White House to discuss tensions with Iran. Joining me now for more analysis is Thomas Callender, Senior Research Fellow for Defense Programs at the Heritage Foundation. Tom, welcome into the broadcast. Hey, thank you. Welcome me, Wyatt. Iran's Revolutionary Guard commander said earlier today, Iran doesn't have any intention of going to war with any country, but it's fully ready for war. What's your reaction as you watch all of this develop in, within the last week? Do you think a military response is likely? I don't think the U.S. is going to respond with a military, uh, you know, strike against, uh, ma a major strike against Iran. I think what you'll likely see is, again, continued restraint by the United States. I think President Trump's uh, follow-on remarks that he had there in the White House saying that he thinks this was a mistake by some general or, uh, you know, someone in the Iranian military, I think goes to that point of trying to leave open some negotiating space for Iran's leadership to hopefully potentially back off of this. Um, more likely, I think, if you see you know, further attacks against shipping, uh, there could be a limited response, military response against potentially the the Iranian Revolutionary Guard that participated in this attack, uh, but I think it would be limited to that or naval vessels or uh, hostile actions. Since the U.S. withdrew from the Iran nuclear deal a little over a year ago, it's reimposed economic sanctions on Iran. How do you think or how do you assess the maximum pressure campaign that they've been putting on Iran? I think the Trump administration's you know, maximum pressure campaign has been very successful, and I think how, why you're seeing that is because uh, the economic impact on Iran uh, from the sanctions, from uh, with U.S. reinstalling, uh, removing the waivers for sanctions against those that buy Iranian oil, has withdrawn uh, from two million barrels of oil to 500,000. So they're feeling the pressure, and they're acting out by both these limpet mine attacks, the, the six over the last month, and now uh, ratcheting up with these attacks on drones. The other key players here is our European partners, European allies, the EU, notably Britain, France, Germany, who were all signatories to the original nuclear deal, have been trying to make sure Tehran sticks to it. Um, obviously, that's taking a seat back seat this week. But at the same time, you know, Iran, like I said, as we reported, has quadrupled the amount of production it's using with low-grade uranium. Do you think there's any way that Tehran could be expected to comply with this? Or at this point, is the nuclear deal dead? And, and where does it go from here? Yeah, it's a, you make some great points there. Why I think the nuclear deal is dead, um, both with Iran's, uh, you know, said by next Thursday that will exceed uh, the limitations of 300 kilograms, also with the intentions to exceed the enrichment uh, percentage. So, and I think, too, these actions now with this drone attack is very different than the limpet mine attacks, which are, you know, they denied their involvement. It was a little more gray area of trying to prove it was the um, Iranians that placed these limpet mines because no one saw them do it. They just saw them remove it. Mm -hmm. um, so now this is a very blatant act. And I think you're going to see that our European allies are now going to, I think, back away from um, where they were standing before, being more reticent and being uh, coming uh, international partners coming together against Iran. A lot of developments this week and a lot more things that could happen in the weeks to come. Thomas Callender, Senior Research Fellow for Defense Programs at the Heritage Foundation. Thanks so much for your analysis. Thank you, Wyatt. North Korea's Kim Jong-un welcomes the president of China for a two-day state visit. President Xi Jinping and his wife took part in a parade through downtown Pyongyang, complete with an open-top vehicle and elaborate welcome ceremony. Xi and Kim then held bilateral talks. It's the first trip to North Korea by a Chinese leader in 14 years and raises the possibility China could help break the months-long impasse in nuclear talks between Pyongyang and Washington. Former London Mayor Boris Johnson increases his lead in the race to be Britain's next prime minister. Conservative lawmakers today held their fourth round of voting, and Johnson received half of the more than 300 votes. The next highest total was 61. The Archbishop of Colombo says Catholics in Sri Lanka are still rebuilding after the devastating Easter bombings. He's pointing the finger at the Sri Lankan government for not doing more to stop it from happening. This disaster could have been prevented because if I knew, by any chance, if I knew 
that there was an attack planned, I would have closed the churches and told the people to go home. And we could have protected all these people. It is serious lapse of responsibility on the part of the government of Sri Lanka. The Cardinal held back tears when talking about the victims of this year's attacks on three churches and three tourist hotels in his country. Cardinal Malcolm Ranjith joins us from Rome. Your Eminence, welcome back to the broadcast. This evening you met with Pope Francis. What did you and the Holy Father talk about? Well, uh, we talked about what happened uh, on Easter Sunday in Colombo and in other places in Sri Lanka. And we had a very cordial, very understanding kind of dialogue with him, whereby I explained to him all what happened and also possible uh, players in that kind of scenario and uh, what we have to do in order to get over these problems. The Easter attacks in your home country left your community and the world in a state of shock. How are Catholics in Sri Lanka coping? Uh, I think uh, they are now uh, reconciled to this fact that this kind of thing can happen because uh, at the initial stages we never expected such a thing to happen to uh, us Catholic community in Sri Lanka because we had always very good relations with all the other religious bodies, especially the Islamic community and it was uh, quite a surprise and something uh, that uh, gave us a lot of, uh, how do you say, feelings of desperation at what happened. By now the community is reconciled uh, to what happened and uh, trying to live and accept and live along with it in the future. Well, I can understand this concern because New Delhi TV is reporting today that India and Sri Lanka are likely to be under threat by ISIS. Would you ever consider canceling masses again? I was told by the Indian High Commissioner that the intelligence uh, section of uh, India informed our government at different levels about the possibility of such attacks. But unfortunately, our political leaders probably miscalculated their strategy and they were caught napping. Are you anticipating that things will get better with the government? Do you think that they're better ready to protect churches? We are always hoping that the government will uh, be a little bit more organized in this matter uh, because uh, they, need to, uh, they need to be more firm. They have to uh, use the security establishment, the intelligence and others to discover what is happening behind the scenes. They cannot wash their hands and say that they didn't know. They knew about it and they should have taken that matter very seriously, which did not happen, unfortunately. Earlier this morning in Rome, you attended the presentation of the annual report for the Papal Foundation, Aid to the Church in Need. What kind of aid are you receiving to help rebuild your archdiocese? Uh, well, uh, what we are trying to do is to uh, help the people affected uh, as uh, much as possible. The two churches, the Catholic churches, are being rebuilt by the government agencies. So we have no need for help for the churches. But what we need more is for our people. Nearly 300 and more families have been affected by uh, what happened. Some families have been destroyed completely. Other families have been left in a terrible state of destitution. So we have to uh, do at least five programs of support for them. One of the programs is about the uh, care of those who have been traumatized. Secondly, we have uh, 176 children who have been deprived of parents or guardians, either both of them or one of them, and as a result they have suffered. So we have to help those children also. Then there are about uh, another 300 people who have been injured and who are in various stages of injury. And we have got to help them to uh, completely recover from that status. So these five programs are being organized, planned by the Archdiocesan uh, Caritas Office and we are carrying out this program in the future. Oh my God bless the Catholics there in Sri Lanka as they rebuild both their communities, the churches and their homes. Sounds like a lot of work. 
uh, still going on there. Cardinal Malcolm Ranjith, Archbishop of Colombo, thank you so much for your insight and for joining us. Thank you very much for your interview. Thank you. Coming up, the Secretary of State unveils an annual report on the fight against human trafficking. Welcome back. I'm Wyatt Goolsby, in for Lauren Ashburn. The United States adds Saudi Arabia and Cuba to its list of worst offenders of human trafficking, the new designation that could limit the amount of aid the U.S. is willing to provide. Today, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo called out those countries and others who he says are not doing enough to stop trafficking. Tier 3 designations, the lowest possible designation, were given once again to China, Iran, North Korea, Russia, Syria, and, and Venezuela, among others. Some of these governments allow human traffickers to run rampant, and other governments are human traffickers themselves. Secretary Pompeo laid out the details of the 2019 Trafficking in Persons Report at the State Department today. He was joined by the advisor to the president, Ivanka Trump, in recognizing individuals from around the world who have devoted their lives to fighting human trafficking. Human trafficking remains a global issue. The International Labor Organization estimates there are 40.3 million victims globally. In April, Pope Francis called human trafficking a, quote, crime against humanity. We detest it because it flagrantly violates the unalienable rights that belong to every human being. Every person, everywhere, is inherently vested with a profound, inherent, equal dignity. Secretary Pompeo says for those 21 countries who are on the worst offenders list, they may face cuts to, quote, non-humanitarian, non-trade-related foreign assistance, and cuts to funds for educational and cultural exchange programs. In addition to recognizing the victims of human trafficking, today is World Refugee Day. The situation is particularly felt in Lebanon, where refugees from Syria make up one-fifth of the population. Two-thirds of the refugee population in Lebanon is living below the poverty line of three or four dollars a day, and more than half under the extreme poverty line, which is less than, than three dollars a day. Many migrants from Syria have been stuck in camps since the country's civil war began more than eight years ago. Lebanese authorities are pressuring Syrians to return to their native land. A famous Catholic church in Austria was saved from possible arson by a tourist using holy water. Yesterday, the visitor noticed two confessional boxes at the Dominican church in Vienna were on fire and doused the flames with holy water. Police say there are signs it could be a case of arson. The extent of the damage is not immediately known, though church officials say the blaze could have been much worse. Up next, in honor of Cardinal Luis Antonio Tagle's birthday, the Archdiocese of Manila welcomes some new blood. Welcome back. I'm Wyatt Goolsby, in for Lauren Ashburn. Pro-life supporters in Michigan are attempting to pass two citizen-initiated bills and will be collecting signatures in the coming days. The measures include a heartbeat bill and a ban on a popular second trimester abortion procedure. If enough votes sign, they could be passed into law without needing the signature of the Democratic governor, who is an abortion supporter. Overseas, a new report shows the number of abortions in the UK reached a record level for 2018. According to data from the Department of Health and Social Care, there were more than 200,000 abortions performed in England and Wales in 2018. That number marks an increase of 4% from the previous year. Dr. Gracie Christie, Senior Policy Advisor for the Catholic Association, joins me now via Skype from Miami. Gracie, welcome back to the broadcast. Those numbers are staggering. The report also indicates nearly 5,000 more non-residents of the UK received abortions there. A spokesperson for the UK pro-life group, Right to Life, calls it a national tragedy. What's your reaction to all this? Well, you know, it is a tragedy, obviously, whenever abortion numbers go up. And I, I was digging a little deeper into the numbers and I found out a few interesting things. For instance, that uh, a lot of this increase is due to higher incidence of abortion by medical means, in other words, abortion pills. And a, a reason for this is that it's being sold to, um, to British women and to American women as well, let's face it, as a very safe and easy procedure, but it's not. You know, an at-home abortion with, with pills is a very traumatic and painful procedure that women are enduring. 
there are a lot of potential repercussions people don't necessarily think about or are aware of. This survey shows an increase in the number of abortions for women over the age of 29 and those who already have a family, while the rates for women under the age of 18 had decreased. How significant is that? Well, again, I was digging a little deeper and I found out that in Britain they cap the, the child tax credit or the payment that the government gives women and men when they have children at the level at the number of two children. So one speculation, there's speculation that that women who are pregnant with their third child or even a fourth child are aborting because they don't have the means to bring this child into the world. Wow, it's incredible. 39% of women who had an abortion reported having one or more previous abortions, as you refer. What does that say about the need for greater support of women who find themselves in this kind of crisis situation? I think it's clear from the numbers that women in Britain are resorting to abortion more and more, and that there, there has to be a deep need somewhere that they are going, whether it's spiritual or moral or um, just even financial, that the British people, the British public, have to find a way to meet these needs so that the women aren't resorting to an abortion, which will be traumatic for them and something and a source of remorse for the rest of their lives. What would you say to some of these women who are considering getting an abortion? I would say, hold on, it's going to be okay, and it's worth it. It's worth it to, to welcome that child into life, and it will be a source of joy for as long as you live. Okay, very good. Important message there and a lot of important uh, numbers that we have to bring to light here. Dr. Gracie Christie, Senior Policy Advisor for the Catholic Association, thanks so much for your time today. Thank you, Wyatt. Tonight on EWTN Pro-Life Weekly, host Catherine Hadro looks back on some of her favorite interviews and stories, including Hollywood couple Kirk and Chelsea Cameron on how adoption shaped their lives and Chelsea's message to moms considering adoption. Pregnancy is a miracle. It's not a problem. There are people who can help you through. And there are, whether you choose to raise a baby, God will, God's grace and his help and his strength will be with you. You can see the interview tonight at 10 p.m. Eastern on EWTN. Visit EWTN.com for other airing times. Finally tonight, the Archdiocese of Manila is asking its priests, seminarians, and employees to donate for a birthday present to Cardinal Luis Antonio Tagle, but they're not asking for money. Instead, it's part of a blood drive. The Cardinal turns 62 years old tomorrow. It's the 12th annual event held in coordination with the Philippine National Red Cross to honor the birthday of the head of the Archdiocese of Manila. And a happy birthday to his eminence from all of us as well here at EWTN. And that wraps up our newscast for tonight. We thank you for watching. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Wyatt Goolsby. We'll be back tomorrow with more news from a Catholic perspective. Good night and God bless.